everybody, it's Cash. Welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me. Hello, my darlings. Lovely to see you all. Uh, thank you to everybody who donated, by the way. Let me just get that out of the way, first of all. Your generosity is mind-blowing, and I'm incredibly grateful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. To all the commenters as well, I think that's I don't know, 13, 1400 comments after the John Denver transition pictures. Uh, I know that thing that happened was remarkable. To me, to you, to everybody. If you haven't seen that video, maybe you want to go back and see it. And if you don't, then to everybody who did see it, it'll be our little secret. <laughs> it really was astonishing. So thank you very much for that. Today I'm going to do a mixed bag, really. A guy called Josh Mandel, who is hoping to win the Senate seat left by Rob Portman in Ohio. Also, I'm going to do Bill Cosby, because he's fresh out of jail. I was wondering what was going to happen to him, whether that stigma of what he's done will ever lift. I also took a look at Getter. <laughs> it's a terrible name. It's a right-wing version of Twitter, basically, a social media platform aimed um, at Trump supporters and conspiracy theorists, basically. So I thought I'd see if that was going to go anywhere. Plus, I did Mexico, because somebody, and maybe a group of people, keep asking for Mexico over and over again. And I kept putting it off, but today I have good reason for doing Mexico, because there's a guy called Jacobo Grimberg, or Jacob Grimberg, basically, who's a Mexican scientist who was very, very much into shamanism and astrology and mind reading, and he wrote tons of books on this, and then he disappeared. Just vanished off the face of the earth, and nobody's seen him since. So I thought I would look at that mystery and see what's happened to him. Speaking of unsolved mysteries, I also did transition pictures for actress Natalie Wood. Many, many people ask for these, and uh, they are, in fact, very interesting. Before we get going, I just want to mention the Liz Cheney pictures. Remember those where she had a leaf blower? She was fending off all these attackers with a leaf blower. Like that. And they all fell back, and she goes forward, but life becomes incredibly slippery, and she's going to go over the edge, and doesn't quite. I said back then, if she could just not go over the edge and keep going, she would be fine and go up to the next level. And she did. She, of course, lost her position within the Republican Party in the House, but she has just been appointed to the Select Committee investigating the January the 6th insurrection, much to the distress of her fellow Republicans, some of whom were responsible for instigating the January the 6th insurrection. <laughs> so that's working out well, eh? Uh, I also wanted to mention Afghanistan because American troops have just pulled out. And if you remember the pictures, there was a metal road that curved up representing the end of the American presence in Afghanistan. Afghanistan then moves to the side, goes forward over a bridge, which usually means a transition time, and then there are these bleak, dark mountain ranges, one after the other. And I think there are great fears, possibly justified fears, that the Taliban is going to uh, take over Afghanistan and turn it into a haven for terrorists, like it used to be. And that could become a reality very soon. And certainly these jagged mountains suggested there was quite a fight ahead with the Taliban. Okay, let's get on with Josh Mandel. He's an ex-Marine who for many, many years was the treasurer for Ohio. And uh, he's very, 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 very pro-Trump. He believes in all that election fraud nonsense. He's against affordable health care. He's against abortion. He's against climate science. He's against clean air standards. <laughs> Apparently, who isn't for clean air? Uh, he's against gay marriage, naturally. Uh, he says, I will never, ever back down on this. Oh, good for you, Josh Mandel. And he's against gays in the military. So he's not the kind of person you want in government, basically. <laughs> but he's the kind of person you might get in because he falls under the same umbrella as Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boba and all these kind of nuts. So I took a look at his pictures to see what was going to happen. And when I found him, 
he was in a very strange position. He was on a cart, uh, a little cart with wheels, flying down this slope. It's like he's in a theme park on the roller coaster, going round and up and down. He is in his element. He loves this. He's having a great time and fully expects to be a senator. Problem is, down the road, and I've seen this in other Republicans' futures as well, particularly the pro-Trump ones, down the road, there's some kind of really evil cloud or something, some downturn, some unfortunate event or turn-up. And I did wonder whether this isn't related to revelations about Trump. In other words, if you stick to him like glue, then whatever sticks to him will stick to you. This is what this felt like, because when Josh Mandel ran into it, he emerged on the other side with a cloud of this Trump stigma all around him. He was marked. Now, for some people, actually, that might be a good thing. But it did cause him to wander off the path. He got momentarily confused. Like, oh, I wish that hadn't happened. Oh, oh, I could have done without that. His campaign manager going, oh, Josh. <laughs> Eventually, he realizes he's gone off the road and goes, I gotta get back on the path. I mean, I'm gonna lose at this rate. He scrambles to try and get back up the hill. Oh my God, I'm gonna lose. And I don't think he knew which way he was going to go. Win, lose, go forward, go back, no idea. And it could very well be because the race in Ohio becomes a tangled, mangled mess. And nobody kind of knows how it's going to work out. It could be that. And since we're talking about messes, let's have a look at Bill Cosby. Formerly America's dad, and now fresh out of prayers because he didn't receive due process at the time, which you're entitled to under uh, uh, the 5th and 14th Amendment of the Constitution. So he got out. And now the issue is, what will happen to Bill Cosby? When I found him, he was skewered on what is an old-fashioned meat thermometer. <laughs> Just go with it, all right? And it was a metal base, and this was weighing him down. The skewer went right through him. When he tried to walk, the skewering of the meat thermometer weakened him anyway, but then the base held him back. It scratched along the ground and prevented him moving forward at any reasonable pace. In the end, it etched a circle in the ground, forced him to go round and round over the same ground. If he's interviewed, that's all anybody will talk about. If he is uh, able to give talks, that's all he will be talking about. It's just his life becomes, even in freedom, even though he's out of prison, his life becomes this constant routine and really doesn't go anywhere. But... He's a winner by nature. This guy's a high achiever. And he's not one to give up. And indeed, he carried on walking. He came to a lip of a hill overlooking a vast city. <sighs> Finally, integration into society. Oh, I made it. Dragging this meat thermometer with him down the little hill. He thinks he's going places. He thinks that he's managed to rescue himself. He gets to the bottom of the hill and there's a fence, a chain link fence, not going anywhere. That's it for him. If he gets that far. So really the advice would be just make the most of what you've got, pal. Stay in the house and read. Enjoy your freedom, because the rest, if you push for it, is not going to be very pleasant. So now we move on to Getter, the social media platform set up by Jason Miller, one of Trump's senior advisors. It was supposed to be about free speech, about not being cancelled, about an exchange of ideas. But apparently the only people they censor or block 
are people with left-wing ideas. That's what I read somewhere. So I did pictures for Getter, even though it really wasn't worth it. And when I went into the energy, Getter, the little person, had a huge plank of wood. He goes down and lays it on the ground into a slot that was prepared for it. And there were many more of these slots. Basically, it was like a boardwalk, but they were building the platform. Lots of optimism. Lots of, hey, we can make this work. It's going to be great. Racists will love this. It's going to be fabulous. So anyway, it walks ahead along this boardwalk and things are looking kind of fine. Then, a bit like the Josh Mandel pictures, which is very intriguing. Then, it comes across a huge, dark, encroaching cloud. It could be something that happens to get her. Maybe even it's the hacking that went on and the stealing of people's information. Could be that. But whatever this was, it suggested either scandal or unfortunate happenings or beastly ghastliness. Something went on that ate into the boardwalk. And from then on, this platform was either stigmatized or it got into some kind of mix-up or mess Something to do with Trump, maybe, or the January the 6th insurrection, but something that tarnished it and made it very rickety going forward. They've got big plans for it. They don't intend it to be taken down or to uh, discontinue it in any way. But it just looked like that once this thing had happened, whatever this thing was, once it had happened, the going was not good after that. I don't even know if it's going to last but if it does last, it doesn't last in a good way. Uh, also, I did Mexico, a country I happen to like, actually. But it's got 126 million people and a huge crime problem. There's lots of inequality there, lots of poverty there. There's abuse of women. The military and the police are sometimes quite arbitrary in their treatment of people. And you find that they'll just kill people. It's like, what? You're supposed to be a civilized society. You're a developed country. And yet they're plagued by all these social problems that don't seem to go away. So because people persistently asked me to do Mexico, I took a quick look. When I found it, it was up to its thighs in a bog. It's kind of calm on the surface and, and glisteny, but under the water was grime and muck and almost like bear traps that it could step into at any moment. It would just clamp shut around its legs. Up above, lovely, fabulous, sunny, bright, shimmering water, very attractive. Underneath, at shin level, geez, what a mess. How murky. And it continued on that way. This is the sad thing about Mexico. It just continues. It, there's an acceptance that that's what it's like in Mexico. But it takes so much of its life force away as a country. So much energy. It's such a waste of resources and human life and dignity to have this going on in your country. But they've accepted it, according to the pictures, as the status quo. Yeah, there are bear traps. Yeah, there's a swamp. Yeah, it's uncomfortable. Ugh, it's murky. Ugh, we're not enjoying this. But look at the sunshine up above. Look at the glistening of the water. Eh, forget about the other stuff. And that's what went on and on and on. Or at least until next year it did. I always assume that these hills that appear are the delineation between one year and the next. So it gets to this hill, it climbs the hill, and goes down to the next year. Bog starts again. They don't deal with the drug trafficking, they don't deal with the crime and the killings. Whatever else, it just keeps on going. Problem is that there are two... I don't even know what they were, but they reminded me of what you get on a wave machine. Sheets of metal that when they flap, 
cause waves. And that's what this was. There are two of them. So maybe two big things happen next year that cause disruptions within the swamp. They churn everything up and make it harder to walk, make it more turbulent. And perhaps remind Mexicans that they could have the good life if only they would do something at whatever level to rid the country of this crime and uh, drug trafficking and so on. That's where it has to begin. The drug cartels and the crime and the major disappearances in Mexico. No trace of them whatsoever. But if they didn't do something, even after this turbulence next year, then the swamp simply continues. Get to it, Mexico. I'll be checking in with you again next year. And of course, they're all listening to me. But speaking of disappearances, though, let's look at Jacobo Grimberg Zilberbaum. That's his full name. He was the scientist. He was actually Dr. Jacob Grimberg. But he was a doctor who wrote about 50 books on esoteric things like shamanism and Eastern mysticism and astrology and so on. It doesn't sound like it would be that controversial, really. But his beliefs and his writings cause a problem with the scientific establishment. Then, in 1994, he completely vanishes. Somebody was holding a birthday party for him in December of that year. And, you know, obviously, he was invited to his birthday party. Never showed up. But they didn't think there was anything odd about that. Because, apparently, Jacob Grimberg very often didn't show up to things. He was just that kind of guy. He went off, he disappeared for a few days or weeks or months and then came back and, oh, he's Jacob, he's fine. This time he didn't come back. And it's been over two decades. Very, very strange. So I thought, I'll take a look at the pictures and see what happened to him. When I went into the energy, I found him and he was straddling a hole in the ground, like a gash. There's forest, there's... Um, jungle or something and 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 it's hard to see this coming this gash he straddles it for a second and then falls into it down 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 there's a ledge bam he falls on this ledge and goes down to the bottom Ooh. oh oh that hurt wow he lies there for a little while then gets up and looks at his surroundings he's in some kind of underground grotto a cold and damp grotto and as he walks along he looks up and there's a hole there another hole and he can see the sky and trees above him but he's trapped down here he can't get out he walks around it he's completely lost there's nobody to help him which if he'd been kidnapped would definitely be the case he carries on walking fully expecting that he'll find an exit. But as he goes along, he loses hope. It's like, whoa, this is not working. I'm going nowhere. I'm lost. This is terrible. He sits down on what turns out to be a turntable. And I hear grinding. It's like, oh, something's moving. But in fact, the entire cave was turning around. Not the turntable, the cave was turning around. And when it faced front, it revealed an entrance with a massive light behind it. And a tongue of light unraveled in front of him, covered him, absorbed him, and he vanished. So, it's entirely possible that he went exploring and literally fell down a hole. Got so trapped that there was no way out and he actually died. And that light was his end. And those caverns were like the transition pictures. From the moment he fell in the hole, he was slowly transitioning and eventually died. A better assessor of these situations is my friend Debbie Griggs, who's a psychic. I've mentioned it before on the channel, uh, Psychic Medium. She's really, really good at finding 
lost people and dead bodies and so on. So I wrote to her and I said, hey, Debs, uh, what do you think of this guy, Jacob Grimberg? What happened to him? I didn't tell her anything I'd seen. I just let her do her thing. And she wrote back and she said, he was taken by two or three men to the jungle or a very forested space. And they killed him because he was putting a spotlight on the drug cartels or he wouldn't do what they wanted him to do. A family member, a female, knew something about this and was in fear of him. He had another life and secrets. And sorry to say, he passed in the forest, was shot and not buried. It was northwest of where he lived. So Debbie thinks that he was taken to the jungle and shot. If that's the case, then everything I saw would be his transition. But my feeling is that if he was shot, he didn't die immediately. He went through this process, which eventually had him dying. But at least both of us agree that Jacob Grimberg is dead. Uh, if he shows up tomorrow and says, Hi, sorry everybody, I missed my birthday party, but I'm back, uh, I will be truly embarrassed. <laughs> but since we're on mysteries, I decided to do the transition pictures for actress Natalie Wood. She was an enormous star in her day. She was Ukrainian, actually, and became a child star at the age of eight in Miracle on 34th Street. She was even nominated for an Oscar in her teens for her role in Rebel Without a Cause. But she went on to do West Side Story, Gypsy, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Then in 1981, she was on a boat in Catalina. She was filming a movie called Brainstorm with Christopher Walken. And she was on her husband, Robert Wagner's yacht off the island of Catalina, when she apparently slipped, fell off the boat and drowned. And even today, nobody quite knows what happened to Natalie Wood. When they found her body, she had bruises and other abrasions. And it was discovered that she and Robert Wagner, who she married twice, actually, but she and Robert Wagner had had an argument before she died because he was jealous that she was flirting, allegedly, with Christopher Walken. And as a result of a drunken brawl or something, she fell over the side and drowned. So, since I had Debbie on the line, I thought I'll ask her what she thought had happened to Natalie Wood, see if she knows anything. She said, I feel Robert Wagner accidentally pushed her off the boat. She had bruises on her arm from Robert grappling with her arm and accidentally tearing on her bracelet. When she fell off the boat, she fell onto the lifeboat or in between and hit her head. She was unconscious when she went under and uh, she drowned. Yes, the two men helped her die, but not on purpose, accidentally. Right, so I thought that was incredibly interesting, and I did my pictures. When I went into the energy, I saw this same metaphorical cave I always see. And there was a rug floating in midair that Natalie Wood was inside. She was wrapped up in it. As it began to unravel, she just rolled out gently onto the floor. I think that represented a sort of numbness brought on by painkillers, alcohol, whatever. At first, she had trouble standing up. Oh, there was a real, literal, sobering moment when she was on the ground and not sure she could get up. But then she realized she felt better than she expected. Because there was no physical pain. She's no longer mortal. And she sat up. A whole packet of feelings rushed in. Sadness. Disappointment. Frustration. This was not part of the plan. This was not supposed to happen. She had big dreams. She had a lot of success to look forward to. And now she felt lost and abandoned, clueless about how to proceed from here. There must have been a game plan 
for her life before this happened. And now the game plan had been torn up and she was just in this, what I see as a metaphorical cave, but a big abandoned space, adrift. There was, as usual, a tunnel which goes towards the light and everybody seems to go up this tunnel. The ascent was solemn and felt arduous because she hadn't left behind the stuff, the plan, the regrets. It's all still there. But she walked up the hill, heavy, heavy hearted. Interestingly, the path to the top was quite thin and either side of it were, they look like tunnels, but you know on a violin, the curved holes they have in a violin, the tunnels look like that. There's one to the left and one to the right. Either one was okay. She walks into the passageway, which curls around on itself. For her, this felt like sanctuary. A hiding place from the inevitable. She needed time to think. If only she could go back and relive those last two hours, she would have done it all so differently. Ah, oh, why did I say that? Why did I do this? What a fool I am. But that wasn't all. There was a sense here that when she was a star, when she was working her way up from child star to adult star, all that really mattered. The career really mattered. The image really mattered. The stardom, the wealth, it mattered. You build your reputation, your legend that way. And now, in the position of this cowering child, essentially, she could see that none of it mattered. It was just stuff. It was just things you did. They were incidentals to what really, really mattered. Which we know is kindness, love, compassion, forgiveness, the path of higher intention. For some reason, she had allowed herself to wander down the path of lesser intention, the path of ego, the path of self-destruction, the path of giving too much credence to things that don't really count. If only I could go back and relive those last two hours, I would make it all so different. I get it now. But she couldn't stay in her little sanctuary. She climbs up to the top of the hill. There is the symbolic light that everybody goes into. But here's the interesting thing. It's off. Which I have never seen before. The cave was dark. She wasn't expected. It was a bit like arriving at the post office about 10 minutes before they open. Lights are off, doors are locked. There's nobody on the desk. And then suddenly, the lights come on, people wander in, the doors are unlocked, and you can get in. It was like that situation. She was definitely not meant to be here. Free will, choice, the decisions she'd made had led her to this moment. We do have free will. We can make a bad decision or a good one. It's an argument for being more conscious in the way we live, more deliberate, evaluating our intention before we act. She had not done those things, evidently. And this was the result. The light being off was simply to let us know about those decisions. But free will is a major factor in all of this. We are gods. We decide. Not always, obviously, but 
a lot of the time. When the light comes on, she has no resistance left. And she lay on the surface, the symbolic surface, of this light. And remember how women in the 1960s and 70s used to luxuriate in mink coats. It's not something most women would do now, but they used to luxuriate in these big mink coats and sink into the softness of the fur. That's what it was like for her. After so much turbulence, here was comfort, solace, refuge, warmth, acceptance. She didn't have to try. Success didn't matter. What you owned was irrelevant. Who you were played no part in this. You were simply a soul ascending. And she sank back and the fur coat just wrapped around her from all different sides. And she went into it and disappeared. It was very sad because here was a truncated life that didn't need to end when it did. But in the process of it ending, she learned what was important and what wasn't. Deliberate, conscious living with a pure, single intention is what gets us where we need to go. Not what we own, who we're with, how famous we are, how much money we have, or anything like that. That's what she learned in her transition. And what I was amazed by as I saw it. That's it. That's Natalie Wood. Alrighty, so thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. Um, subscribe, like, share. If you would, that'd be great. Follow me on Twitter, at Cash Peters. Not on Getter. I will never be on there. And I'll see you next time, guys. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.